started. My name is Jajette Webb, and I am the Associate Area Agent for Agricultural Literacy and STEM Education here at the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. And this morning, I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Juliana Espindola, and we are bringing you an international presentation this morning from Brazil. So I won't waste any more time. Uh, Dr. Juliana, I'll let you go ahead and take it from here. Thank you, Jijad, for the invitation. I'm so excited to be here today. And let's get started. Today, I'm going to be talking about science and agriculture and a few things about what I do in seed science. So let me start talking about how I got into agriculture. When I was a kid, my mom gave me a microscope. So I was a very curious kid and I would go to our garden and pick up some leaves and flowers and I would look at them and try to think how that plant became such a big tree and all that stuff. But my mom, she wanted me to be a doctor. And then by that time, I liked the idea, but it wasn't like my passion. I knew it that I wanna be I want to be doing some kind of science, but for some time I thought, well, I'm going to be a doctor. I don't come from an agriculture family, and when I tried to got into medical school, it was so hard, and then I changed it to biology, and I thought, well, I can still do science. I can work with steam cells. I can try to find some cure for a disease, things like that. And there was a time that I needed to write a monography and my professor told me that the university didn't have like the structure for me to do that kind of research. And then I needed to change. And I thought, well, what I'm gonna do it. So I got an internship in an uh, agriculture company called Embrapa. And I started working in a laboratory that they did like germinations and they stored seeds, all, all things about seeds they used to do there. And then I fell in love with seeds. It was like me thinking, I never thought about that. Why I never thought about that? Maybe because my mom was always, always telling me that I should be a doctor but I should have listened to that little girl when I was in my garden looking for leaves and flowers. And then I found myself. And then I decided to do a master's degree and get a PhD all in agronomy. Um, I had the opportunity to go to the United States in 2014. I spent a year there, I made lots of friends. And then I came back and I finished my PhD and I started the doing, it's kind of a internship, but you're, you work as a research at the university. And that's what I do now. And I thought that I needed to get more knowledge about agriculture because when you get a degree in biology, you don't see all the, the important classes about how to produce plants. So while I was doing my internship as a researcher, I was taking classes and next year I'm going to get my second degree in agronomy. Also, this year I thought, well, I have so many pictures. I have so many work that I have been doing all these years about plant production and seed. And I want to share it with everybody. So I started this Instagram profile and it's called Seed Science. I will talk more about later with you guys. And as you can see, life is not a, like a straight line. You're not going to figure it out everything once. So what I advise you guys is try everything and look for your passion, follow your passion. If you like agriculture, you don't need to come from an agriculture family. You just need to like plants, and want to research or maybe just work in a farm. And here's an example when I shift from a biologist, studying animals from to plants. So I tried everything. All the time that I had the opportunity to be working with people and try new things, that's what I did. 
And here is another example that if even if you're in agriculture area, you don't need to work in the field, only in the field, you can also work in a lab. So here are some examples of some of my work in the lab and in the field. So try it. That's what I'm trying to send the message here. If you're looking for a career, try everything until you find your passion. So let's get started. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about three, three topics, plant biodiversity and agriculture, uh, and agriculture in Brazil, the importance of science and agriculture to pursue sustainability, and why seeds are so important in our lives. Um, if you don't know where Brazil is in the map here, we are located in South America. Brazil has 26 states. The capital of Brazil, it's called Brasilia, and the language that we speak is Portuguese. Here are some examples of the cities that we have here. Uh, you might hear the name Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro. They are very famous cities for tourists. But I encourage you to look for cities like Recife, Manaus, Rio Grande do Sul. They are so beautiful. You will love it. So next, let's talk about the Brazil biodiversity. So here we have six major biomes. Sometimes we think that Brazil, it's only about uh, the Amazon forest, but it's not. And here I put it the name in Portuguese of our six biomes. And Amazonia is the Amazon forest and it covers 49% of the country. The second one is Cerrado and it covers 23.3% of the country. It's like a savanna. Um, the next one is Mata Atlântica, that means Atlantic Forest, and represents 13% 13 of the country. Uh, we have Caatinga, that it's like a desert, and represents 10% of our country. And we have Pampa and Pantanal. Um, here are some pictures, because if we are going to talk about biomes, Pictures are the best way to show you how Brazil look like. So Amazon forest, it's so diverse. Look at the rivers and the, the trees. Uh, they're just gorgeous. I think uh, the Amazon forest is the most beautiful forest in the world. And here uh, in this picture, look at how interesting this picture is. Here we have two rivers. The river in your left, it's the right river, and your right, it's the black river. But if you see here, they don't mix. How interesting is that? And why that happen? So the, that happens because the temperature of the two rivers are different. Like the white river, the temperature is 72 Fahrenheit, and the Black River, it's 82. Also, the speed of the river makes a difference. 3.7 against 1.2 miles per hour. So they flow side by side for four miles until they find the Amazon River, the biggest river in the world. And when they get there, they mixed. Next biome, it's Kachinga. And it looks like the desert. You will see a lot of cactus, some trees that look like they're dead, but they're not. I'm sure you have, you're familiar with this kind of biome also there. Here we have Cerrado, it's like a savanna. You don't see a lot of, a lot of trees like you see in the Amazon forest, but it's still, it's beautiful and very diverse. Here is the Atlantic forest. It looks like the Amazon forest, but it, if you look closely, we have, uh, they are different. They're not the same and it, the Atlantic forest, it's cl close to the coast. And here Pampa, it's close to, it, it's similar to Cerrado. So it's also a savanna. And here Pantanal. So it's an area full of swamps. 
So now that we know Brazil, it's a diverse country with uh, many species, let's talk about the agriculture in Brazil. So soybean is the, it's like the crop that we produce more here. So Brazil's represent like 38% of the all soybean produced in the world. In the United States come second. So here we have, we produce in 2021, 137 million tons. In United States, United States, 112 million tons. Exportation also, we represent 49% of the exportation soybean in United States, 37. Um, corn, we don't produce a lot of corn like United States, but we still produce something like 8%. Exportation is 12%. Um, cotton, we only represent 10% of the cotton produ production in world and United States 30%. Exportation, we represent 23% in United States 34 um, I, I don't know if you have seen sugar cane before in your life, but this is how the plants look like. And we have, we represent 24% of the production. Also, we have coffee production. We represent 44% of the production. Um, and here, I only put this information about chicken, beef, and because we also produce and export a lot. We are first in exportation in chicken and beef, but we are second in production. United States, it's first in production. India, it's uh, in, in chicken. But in beef, India is first, and China is first in production of pork. And we are fourth. Here's an interesting graphic about the productivity and the production here in Brazil from 1977 to 2020. So if you can see the green line and the blue line, they increase uh, over the years, but the red line is kind of flat. And this red line means the area that we plant our crops. So you see that we are producing more, but we are not increasing our areas. So this, it's a good information about how we are using technology in our favor, because in the future, we are going to have a lot of people to feed and we cannot be using all the space. So we have an estimation to Brazil, for Brazil in 2030, we are going to have an increase of 27.1% in grant production and our area will increase only 17%. And all of that happens because of science. We use science to produce more and use less land. But if you think in the past, uh, we used to think that the earth was flat. And imagine when one day someone came and told them, hey, earth is not flat, it's rounded. And people thought, no, you're crazy, that's not true. How come? If it's rounded, we would fall. How come we don't fall? So this is an example of how hard it is for people to believe in technology. But I kind of understand in the past because we couldn't see how we would see if the earth was rounded or flat. But today we have satellites and they can show us that the earth is rounded, it's not flat. And this is an example of the previous example because GMOs, in in the past, people were doing this kind of propaganda to terrorize people about GMOs. And up to now, we don't have any, any research that shows that GMOs cause any harm to human beings. 
So it's totally safe. And I feel sad when people do this kind of advertisement without knowing what we actually do. So let's talk a little bit about GMOs, what they are. So the definition is organisms genetically, genetically, uh, genetically manipulated in order to favor desirable characteristics. And I'm sure you have heard about the transgenic and I can tell you that transgenic, it's like when I pick up a gene from another species and I put in the species that I'm studying. But not all GMOs are transgenic, okay? Put that in mind. Not all GMOs are transgenic. Why is that? That happens because I can also edit the genome. I don't need to be using some other species gene to make a, a species better. So this is the future and you're going to be hearing a lot about CRISPR technology. And I think this is even better than transgenic because I'm not putting any other species gene in my species. I can only pick up a piece of gene that I'm not interested and in. like a scissor, I'm gonna cut it and remove it. And then my plant is not going to express that characteristic that I'm not interested. Let's see this example of tomato. Like tomatoes in 45 days, they are all spoiling. But if I cut it, just a, a little piece of the genome, and we call that thing like si silencing the genes, I can just make tomatoes uh, have a shelf life for more than 45 days if I want it. I just need to find the right genes. And that doesn't affect the whole plant. It's not going to harm our health. I'm just removing a characteristic that I'm not interested. The rest will be fine and the same. And also, I'm sure you have heard about mutation. Mutation happened in nature. We, are, we didn't like invented the mutation. And people think that always mutation are something bad and they're not always something bad because they're the main sources to genetic variability. So we all, we're only, what we do as scientists, what we do is we see something that happens in nature and we use in our favor, okay? So here's an example of all the GMOs that we have in Brazil in the United States. As you can see, you have more GMOs than we have. We have six so far. But all of them, they're only, uh, they're, these GMOs, the only thing that the scientists changed was just a little characteristic that may be the resistant to insect or to herbicides. So I can use less pesticides and think that it's better I use less pesticide and use GMO, then I don't use GMO because I'm afraid it's going to harm me. But still, I'm going to need to apply more pesticide because I need to control the pests in my field, right? So also, we have plant breeding. Plant breeding, it's not always about GMO. Plant breeding, it's what we, it's something that we saw in nature as well, and we use in our favor. For example, we have plants in the field and they're going to cross pollinate it. All the pollen will be crossing between plants and that happens naturally. What we do is get an advantage and choose the pollen from the plants that we see some good characteristics and then we cross them and we are going to have plants with better characteristics. For example, here, I have a plant that it's a viral resistance and another crop that has a higher yield crop. If I cross them, I'm gonna have both characteristics in one plant. And this is good, this is not bad. This is not going to harm our health. Also, look at this example. Imagine that this is, was the first corn ever. 
Imagine how we are going to feed the whole world with a corn like this. This ear, it's so small. But what the um, human, we human beings did was just selecting. Uh, we saw a, a bunch of corn plants and instead of picking all the plants, we only choose the ones that had a bigger ear and uh, from ear, from ear, and more ears, the ear became this big ear, corn ear. And sometimes when we think about technology, it, it seems like we are going to a laboratory. And then the next day I have a corn with all the characteristics that I wanted. And it's not, it takes time. Like conventional breeding that is just cross-pollinating plants can take eight to 10 years of work. So it's a lot of work to make two characteristics to be in one plant. Because sometimes I'm going to cross plants and that characteristic that I like, it's not going to stay in the plant. So that it takes years because I'm going to be breeding and breeding and breeding until that characteristic is in the gene and being expressed. If you think the genome, we have many genes, but not all the genes in the genome are expressed. And today, what we want to do is put, use the conventional breeding and add genetic modification to decrease the years that we take to have new varieties in the field. For example, if I use genetic modification, like that crispy technology, it could take only three, four, three to five years of research until I have a cultivar that I can use it. So this is one example of how we observe nature and we try to get the best and apply in our crops and in a faster way. Here is an example about how we could decrease the use of pesticides. Let's imagine we have two fields, right? So field A, I'm gonna use seeds, soybean seeds. I'm not gonna treat it, I'm not gonna put any pesticides. And in the field B, I'm gonna treat it my seeds with fungicide because I imagine that maybe in the future my seeds might need, so I'm going to treat the seeds and sow them. So now let's imagine that like 20 days later, I'm having a problem with fungus in my field A. How I'm going to resolve this problem? I need to apply fungicide. But look at this, I'm gonna need to apply fungicide in the whole field. And if, I was the farmer from the field B that thought, hey, I might need this fungicide, but I don't wanna use a lot of pesticides, so I'm going to put a small amount in my seeds and that should be enough. And this is an example. Now field, uh, the farmer from field A needs to apply the fungicide in the whole area and the farmer from the field B doesn't need to uh, apply any pesticide because his seedlings are healthy, okay? So probably in the future, we are not going to stop using pesticide because it's very hard. But what we are doing in order to be sustainable, it's reducing how we use the pesticide because uh, not all pesticides, they're bad and it, it's going to harm us. If you know how to use it, it doesn't have any effect on us. So what we can do in order to reduce applying pesticides and fertilizers or control the management of water, we are going to use precision agriculture. We are going to be using drones and satellites. So imagine in the future where a farmer doesn't need to apply pesticide in the whole field because one drone, it's going to identify that plant and it's going to apply only in that plant that needs that pesticide. So that's going to that's going to be so safer for all of us and for the environment 
because if we if we want to have a balanced environment, we need to use our tools wisely. And here in this image, where you see a lot of squares, and each square has a color, and this is a way of farmers know where to apply the fertilizers. So imagine that in the green squares, you don't need to apply any fertilizers because there, it's okay. The nutrition of the soil, it's okay. But here in red, he needs to apply. And the system will tell him which nutrient he needs to apply and the right amount. And this is just great. It saves a lot of money. And here in red, it's an example how we can identify the crop when they're having water deficiency. The deficiency. And in red, the, the plants need water. And when they're like yellow and green, eh, they're okay. And here below, you can see that the crops that are stressed, they change color. Now they're red and yellow. And the crops, they're okay. They have a darker color. Here it's dark and here is red, probably because here he didn't plant anything. So how can we achieve sustainability? So we need a balanced environment. We need to use technology in our favor. So we need to stop thinking that all technologies are bad. Sometimes we watch a lot of movies and that can get into our mind thinking that, oh my gosh, technology is bad for the environment. I cannot be sustainable with uh, technology. But I think that technology is going to help us to be sustainable in the future. Also, we need to have a critical thinking because we cannot believe in everything that is out there, but we need to do our research. Okay, someone is telling me that GMOs are not okay. So I'm going to find all the papers that tell me that this story is true and all the papers that this tells me that this story is not true. And I'm going to have my own idea. Okay, this is how you do critical thinking. And also, even if you don't agree with something, you need to think, well, I need to find a solution for that as well. I cannot just be blaming everybody. I can also do my part because we live in a society and we need to help ourselves, right? So we use science and also curiosity. It's the key for everything, guys. You need to use your curiosity. If you want to invent anything, curiosity is the key, okay? So next, let's go to the last topic. And this topic, it's my favorite because now we are going to talk about seeds. How important do you think they are in our lives? Have you thought about it? So let's see. So seeds, they're in our lives since you, we landed in this planet. And we use them as a source of food. And if you don't believe in that, we have a seed vouch in Norway where we storage all the seeds of all the species around the world. So every country, they send seeds to this vouch so they can storage. And if one day we have a natural disaster or we have some equipment failure or something happens in United States or in Brazil, we can recover those seeds because they're stored in that in Norway. We have right now 1 million samples of crops there. And the temperature in this vault is minus 0 0.4 Fahrenheit. And if you see here, the vault goes inside of the mountain. So if something happens, maybe the energy is cut it will take like two centuries to warm up to 32 Fahrenheit. How insane is that? How can a place like this stay for centuries below 32 Fahrenheit? So this is a special place. This is why they choose this place because there the seeds will be safe. 
Uh, and if you don't think that seeds are so important in our life, I'm gonna give you some example of things that we eat and sometimes we don't know that comes from seed. For example, chocolate. Did you know that chocolate come from coca seeds? Yeah. And the flour that we eat in our bread also comes from wheat seeds. Coffee, coffee comes from the beans. Even if you're eating a McDonald, you're eating seeds with seasoned seeds. Here's an example of other kind of seeds that you might eat daily. Maybe you eat, you eat the seeds or something's made of the seeds. So let's think about how can I germinate seeds? How can I do that? Well, each species needs four things. Water, light, temperature, and oxygen. Each species will have an ideal temperature that they can germinate. And for example, soybean, it's around 77 to 86, 86 Fahrenheit, the germinate, germination temperature. And if I give my seeds all these four, they will germinate and become beautiful seedlings like you can see here. Here's an example how we figured out where are the embryos inside of the seed. Here's an example of bean seeds. Can you see here the embryo? It's like a small plant. So you can see the kind of the leaves, the root, and then this is how the seeds looks when it's dry. But if I put in, so if I soak these seeds in water, look how the color change and look at the size of the embryo, how it change. So it happens very fast because when the seeds get in contact with the water, it activates the metabolism of the seed. It's the sign that the seed it's it's seen oh it's not now it's time for me to germinate and become a plant and here's an example how this seed will germinate and emerge uh, and also i wanted to tell you that not all seeds have the same quality sometimes i'm gonna have seeds with good quality and seeds with bad quality how do i know that i need to germinate them. And here's an example in beans, how high quality seeds look like. Can you see how the structure of the seeds is well developed? Look at the roots. And here, when you see the low quality seeds, it takes a longer time for them to grow. Here are the numbers that it took for this seedling to become a a plant like it took like seven days for a low quality seeds to have this size and a high quality seeds in six days i already have a healthy seedling here's an example of the morphology not all seeds have the same morphology like cotton you can see that it's weird it looks like it's all folded so this, this area here that you, it looks like it's folded are the cotyledons and they have the reserve that is going to feed the embryo. And here in corn, uh, you're looking that the corn is red, it's not red. It, I stained this embryo to see if the embryo was alive. And when it gets this red color, it means that it's alive. And as you can see, it has a lot of structures. And sometimes you think, oh, it's such a small embryo. Why so many names? You have to think that one day this will become an adult plant. So it needs all the structures. Here's an example for cotton. So cotton has a, I think it's a special way of flowering because the flowers, when they open, they look like 
white. And the next day when you go there and look them again, they're pink. And the pink color that you see in the flower means that they are pollinated by insects or by the wind. But that it's a sign that tells me that this flower will become a fruit and then later the bowl. And here how the fiber looks like inside of the bowl and the seeds are inside of the bowl. And as you can see here, this is the seed and around the seed, you can see the fiber, right? But if I want to sow seeds, cotton seeds, I need to remove this fiber because uh, it, it's, it makes it difficult for me to sow seeds if they have the fiber. So I'm going to apply some chemicals to remove the, the, the fiber. And then I'm going to neutralize these chemicals because I don't want the chemicals to harm my seeds, right? And then they have this white look. This is limestone. That's why they are looking white, but the, the original color is brown. And here's another example of high quality seeds and low quality seeds. It, and also, when the seed has low quality, we say that it has low vigor. And vigor means that the capacity of that seed to germinate faster, because we don't want seeds to be uh, in the ground waiting and waiting, because if they stay long in the ground without germinating and become a seedling and then a plant, the microorganism, the fungus, the bacteria, all the um, living things that are in the soil will eat the seeds and it's not going to germinate. So high quality seeds, they germinate faster. And you can see here, like they chew, look at the side of this root and this root, it's clear. This here has a better quality, right? And you can see that every single day, as the seedling start to develop, you can see that low quality seeds shows the struggle. It takes longer, it's like it's lower. And if something happened, let's imagine that we had a week where it didn't rain or the temperature was high or cold, probably, this seedling will die because it's not ready. It, it has poor quality, but this seedling, it can get like in five days, this seedling here can achieve, achieve 14 centimeters. Then we need to calculate four inches later, but it's a big seedling. Here's an example of acai. I'm sure you have tried acai. Acai is a palm tree. My thesis was about acai seeds. I was trying to find a way to store them because acai seeds has a, acai seed has a, pick, a different way of how can I say, I cannot dry the seeds too much because they can die. It's not like soybean that I can dry and they're going to be alive for six months. Acai seeds, after I harvest them and I remove the poop, I need to sow them as fast as I can because if I don't and they dry, they will die. Uh, usually when you harvest seed, uh, acai seeds, it, you can wait like three months tops. After that, you cannot use the seeds anymore. And then you need to wait for the next season. So here are the berries or fruits. We remove the fruits and we use the pulp to eat. But what is interesting, look at the size of the seeds. 80% of the fruit is just the seed. So you can see that I need to have a lot of acai fruits to make uh, acai. 
because probably you look at this and think, oh, most of the part of this fruit is just the pulp, but it's not. It's the seed. And guess what? It takes 30 days for these seeds to germinate. It's, it takes like forever to germinate an acai seed. And look how beautiful the seedlings are when they germinate. Here, I want to show you coffee plants. If you haven't seen coffee plants, this is how they look like. Uh, you will see species of coffee plants where the berries are red, and there are some species the berries are yellow. This is how the flower looks like. And after the pollination, uh, I, I can tell you here, this is the, how the, the fruit develops. So we start to grow slowly and slowly and slowly, and then start changing the color. And that it's a sign that it starts to maturing and it's almost ready. And here is an example, what happens with the seed inside of the, the berry. And, and the same thing as acai, here, look how much the seed is inside of the fruit. It covers almost 90% of the fruit is just the seed. And that's good because we don't, we only use the, the seeds in coffee. And here's an example of the seedlings. And here another example of a variety of coffee that we use for breeding because they have a small seeds. The seeds are very small. So we only use this variety to cross because they have some characteristics that interested us. So sometimes you're gonna go back in some old varieties and use them to cross with the varieties that we have today, just so we can choose some characteristics that can help us. So the last topic is that I wanna talk to you, it's vigor. So vigor, it's something so easy to understand when you look in a picture. For example, here in cotton, you will see, if I ask you, which one of these two seed load have the higher vigor? For sure, you're gonna look and think, well, I think this one, because all the seedlings emerge. And look at here, not all of them, some, are, some of them are missing, right? So when I look at this, I know that this seed load, it's not a good one. And if I'm a farmer, and I need to sow seeds in my field, I prefer to use this seed load instead of this one. So this is also an example of vigor by showing the size of the seedling. So all these seeds come from the same variety. They were harvested in the same year, but you can see they have different vigor. And all of them uh, were sold in the same day. And it took five, they, they have now here five days. There are five days old here. So you can see the difference of size. And when you see this, you also can say, well, these seedlings have a different vigor. And you can choose. Imagine if uh, I had like four different seed loads. I would you choose this one because they look better. Maybe I would choose like seed load one and two, but these ones, they don't look so nice, right? And they're more successful to disease. If you see here in their roots, it's kind of brown. And this is a kind of fungus that attack cotton. This is also is a, an example of corn, can you see the difference in size, right? But sometimes 
We cannot compare different cultivars. We can only compare vigor if it's the same variety, the same cultivar, the same species. Because sometimes cultivars have different uh, plant morphology and we cannot compare. L look at here. If I, if I ignore it, if, I, if I'm just giving you an example of vigor, I would say, mm, this one is better than this one. But here I have two cultivars and they have the same vigor. But this cultivar here has a different seedling structure. So they're taller. They're naturally, naturally taller than this one. So I cannot compare. So they have, uh, in this example, they had the same percentage of emergency, but the seedlings of this cultivar are always uh, taller than this one. So this is my Instagram that I told you earlier. I, if you like plants, if you like seeds, if you like to learn more about agriculture or plant production, make sure to go there and check out. And if you like it, you can follow me. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much for your attention. And that's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Juliana. This was fascinating. And I have to tell you, I have a whole new appreciation when I eat acai because I had no idea that there, most of that is the huge seed. I, it takes yeah. a lot to make. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. And also, I just have to tell you, um, teachers, how I came to learn about Dr. Juliana's research. So I found her on Instagram and I was fascinated by how she would document her research process. And she has all types of seeds. And recently, Dr. Juliana, I was fascinated by, there was some plant and you would touch the leaves and then the yeah. leaves would close up. What was that? Yeah, that was a defense mechanism. So when we touch it, or if we shiver it, it closes just to defend itself because they think it's something, it's attacking like an insect or maybe a human being tried to bother them. But it's just an a instinct that they have. It, this is the only species that I know it closes. The other one that I know it's the one that it's insect. Yeah, it's like a Venus flytrap almost, right? They close it when they have some insect. I think it's so fascinating how they detect how sensitive they are. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we think that plants are something that we shouldn't like care too much. Sometimes I, I think we care more about animals than plants, but I think we should respect the all kinds of living things on our planet, like plants, animals, all of them have something to offer us. Yes, I, I agree. And also I would just like to say one other thing. I noticed that you document different sizes of seeds. There was like a, a tree and I think it was huge. It was a huge, uh, seed. It was like a. It's transferred by the wind. Obviously, I could tell by the structure of it. So. Yeah, yeah. Some seeds they have different structures that they. they I maybe with the evolution, it was a way of spreading the seeds. Because if you think I have one tree, it's not good for this tree if all the seeds just follow there. Fall follow that and then fold that it's more interesting if i i'm a tree and i develop my seeds in a way that they can fly by the wind so yeah. the wind they going to spread so it's different structures that the seeds develop to that make it easier for the seeds to be spread yeah, it's fascinating. Thank you so much. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A. Uh, we have a comment today. Um, 
this uh, this uh, person uh, who was joining us said it was a fabulous presentation. She learned so much and she really enjoyed it, Dr. Juliana. So Thank I know you. some teachers may have to um, jump off just because of their schedule. But mm -hmm. as I mentioned before, anyone who registered will receive a copy of the link. And please reach out to Dr. Juliana if you have questions. She's been so generous here to put her, her email uh, address as well. So uh, please take her up on it when she said she'll answer any questions because she um, wants to help students understand more about seeds and agriculture. So. Um, I thank you all for joining us. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Dr. Juliana, before we close? Um, I just would like to thank you all for coming here, taking the time. If I expired one, peop one person today to work with plants, I will be the happiest person ever. So if you have any questions, just reach out to me on my email or Instagram. I would be glad to answer any question. Thank you very much for the invitation to chat. Yes, you're most welcome. And I hope to see you again. So Me we'll too. hopefully continue this relationship. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.